Well, hello there. My name is Jake from J&J Tabletop, and I ran Dragons of Stormwreck Isle. I learned a few things about it along the way. I made some mistakes of my own. I also found what I believe to be some pretty obvious oversights in its design. And overall, I'd still have to say I had a lot of fun running this game for my friends. So what I want to do with this video and this series as a whole is take my experience and take what I've learned Give it to you so that you can get the most out of your adventure. Let's get started. So before we get started, I'm going to just give out the obvious, hey, there's going to be spoilers about the whole thing in this video in particular. But yeah, if you're going to be a player in this campaign, I... I guess proceed with caution. I'm not sure exactly maybe why you clicked on it, but you're going to have a very different experience if you play the game after watching this video. That being said, while you're taking a moment, why don't you head down to the subscribe button and hit it and maybe the like button, maybe the bell and uh, maybe give me three emojis that tell me about your favorite class in Dungeons and Dragons. The Dragons of Stormwreck Isle takes place along the Sword Coast in the Forgotten Realms, which is really the flagship setting for Dungeons and Dragons. Now, it starts off by giving you some good foundational information about Bahamut and Tiamat and why metallic and chromatic dragons don't get along. According to legend, two families of dragons came into being in the very first days of the world's creation. Bahamut, the noble platinum dragon, made the metallic dragons gold, silver, bronze, brass, and copper. Cruel five headed Tiamat made the chromatic dragons. Red, blue, green, black, and white. The metallic and chromatic dragons share a mutual animosity that originates in the enmity between Bahamut and Tiamat. Bahamut is often called the king of metallic dragons in the world of the Forgotten Realms, and Tiamat the queen of chromatic dragons. The origin of Dragon's Rest is rooted in that animosity. Ages ago, a fire-breathing red dragon called Sharuth rampaged up and down the Sword Coast. Three metallic dragons joined forces to battle Sharuth and imprisoned her beneath the ocean floor, believing that seawater would quench her fire and keep her bound forever. But Sharuth's fury, legend says, caused the undersea volcanic activity that formed Stormwreck Isle. In all likelihood, Sharuth is long dead and entombed beneath the island, but chromatic dragons whisper that she still lives and will one day emerge from her prison. One fact is undeniable. The powerful magic embodied in such an ancient dragon has left a permanent mark on Stormwreck Isle. That magic has drawn other dragons to the island throughout the centuries, making it a recurring battlefield in the conflict between chromatic and metallic dragons. Several of these dragons have died there, each leaving behind a spiritual scar that causes unpredictable magical effects. A hundred years ago, a blue dragon tried to harness this destructive magic. A bronze dragon named Runara pleaded with him to abandon his schemes. When he refused, Runara killed him, adding one more dragon grave to the island. Runara has grown weary of strife, and Stormwreck Isle's wounds are a constant reminder to her of the cost of such conflict. Devoting herself to peace and reconciliation, she established the Cloister of Dragon's Rest as a safe haven from violence. Living in human guise, Runara now serves as the leader of a tiny group of hermits and disciples. But the ageless conflict between chromatic and metallic dragons threatens to disrupt the serenity of Dragon's Rest, and this is where our adventure begins. Okay, let's talk party size and composition. This adventure is designed for a group of four or five player characters to go on. Now, if you're going to be giving a true starter experience, like if you have people that haven't played before, all those kinds of things, I think four or five works great. Uh, but if you do want to run this for a veteran group, I think it can still work fine. But I think I would recommend maybe three, which is a really fun group size to work with because just a little shorthanded can make things fun and some decision points. Anyways, that's a whole different topic. And if you are new to running combat and combat design, um, I, we have videos here that Josh and I have gone over that with the CR system, what makes encounters fun, all that kind of stuff. So I highly recommend you check that out. But again, if you are running this for new players, I think four or five is the sweet spot for you. 
for me, one of the highlights of this module is that it comes with pre-made characters. This is, after all, a starter set, so a lot of new players might get overwhelmed with all the different decision points that you have when you're making a character, and it's nice to have an example that you could either work off of or use. Uh, for example, our group, you know, we made our own because we've got veteran players that we were using with Josh and Nooch and Michael and, and Ricky. And uh, what I ended up doing was I took the backgrounds of each of those pre-made characters, which fit in really nicely with the story. And we just kind of worked together to kind of make it all cohesive. And it actually fit together seamlessly. So that's something I would highly recommend because this adventure, it really does kind of introduce just really nice, rich role-playing elements. And man, the group that I played with, they knocked it out of the park. So if you haven't watched their playthrough, I would recommend doing that. It should help inspire you. You can also make fun of me for all the mistakes I made. But nonetheless, I really like that they provided that in a starter set. And I just think it helps that part of the game shine. Dragons of Stormwreck Isle comes with four chapters to it, starting with chapter one, the group's arrival at Dragon's Rest, which is just the name of the cloister that the bronze dragon Runara looks after. And this sort of serves as like a home base for the group moving forward throughout the campaign. Chapter two, we've got the Seagro Caves, which was my personal favorite section from our playthrough, where the group gets to help the Myconids recover from a mysterious illness that has taken hold of some of their own, including their leader, Sinensa. Chapter three, we've got the Cursed Shipwreck, unravel the mystery of why undead have come to the cloister, and they also get to learn a little bit about Orcus, which this module doesn't really tie into the story all that much, but I've got ideas in which we could change that. The stuff you're going to have to watch future videos in this series for me to really dive into. And then the last chapter is the Clifftop Observatory, where the showdown with the Blue Dragon Wormling Sparkrender takes place. Uh, Sparkrender is a blue dragon, now he's one of the chromatics, and he believes he could kind of summon some of the power of his ancestors to just become more powerful. Kind of a, a pretty straightforward thing. The adventure kind of flows where you, after they do chapter one, they could choose to do either two or three, and then they do the other, and then they progress to chapter four from there. Now, this adventure does use the milestone leveling system, which is very popular these days, starting the group out at level one, and then working their way up to level three. Now the module says to move the group to level two when they do their third adventure and level three on the last one. I actually move them up to level two for the second and third adventures because both modules contain instructions for handling level one or level two characters. And I just thought that would be more fun to have more bad guys and you know more powerful characters there. Plus, Usually speaking, when this game, the higher the level, the less that kind of goes wrong with like weird, lucky or unlucky dice rolls. So you can do that however you want. There's instructions for both, but that's just what I did. Now let's talk about NPCs. In my opinion, the NPCs are pretty much going to be your bread and butter, meat and potatoes, all other fun metaphors, <laughs> part of your module and DM experience, because the NPCs do so many things. They're usually like quest givers. They're usually uh, comedic relief. They can also be kind of the thing that your players form attachments to, which is why the adventure has high stakes. And so the NPCs are always something that I want to emphasize when I make a video like this. And I believe that there are three major NPCs that you need to know most about. And let's start with Runara, the bronze dragon. Just like other metallic dragons, Runara can take humanoid form, and she does that in the form of a more elderly woman. And uh, she's very, she's very wise. She's very peaceful. She's I, I tried to have her speak in just like calm tones and things like that. And I probably had a lot more Yoda isms in there than maybe I originally intended when I did her voices and things like that. But that's the kind of character she is. She's dedicated to peace. She's dedicated to helping people recover from lives of violence. Ultimately, she wants metallic dragons and chromatic dragons to live together in peace and harmony. That's the kind of character Runara is. And whether it was just our own playthrough, uh, some combination of that, scheduling issues we had when we were doing it, uh, where certain information is located, me getting overwhelmed as a dungeon master and not remembering exactly the right answer in certain points. I feel like some of the information they give about her 
kind of, I'm not going to say paints her in a bad light because that's not fair to say, but I think it, it kind of leaned into her being maybe too mysterious that it almost came off a little bit more as suspicious. And uh, my players were great sports about it. I think they were kind of just like, oh, I guess we'll just go on this, this adventure now because that's what the dungeon master has planned. And it, good players are going to do that. And, and everybody's going to understand that you didn't write the adventure, but with Brunara, I really think I would rather have done a few things differently with her. And I'm going to have some story points modified for you throughout this series to try and help put you in a good position to succeed as you role play Brunara, because she really probably is the most important NPC to just have a good understanding of throughout the adventure. Next up, we've got Tarek, who is a middle aged human man who is a uh, botanist. He's someone who knows a lot about herbs and alchemy and that kind of a thing, and actually worked as a poisoner for the Thieves Guild, the Gilded Gallows, and is looking to turn over a new leaf. And that's why he's here at Dragon's Rest. Now, the halfling rogue pre-made character, and in our playthrough, we had a rogue, uh, Domingo, played by Ricky, who did a fantastic job. I loved some of the interplay that I got to do with him between Domingo and Tarek. I thought that was a lot of fun, which Ricky, you threw some curveballs at me, and I like to think I hit him out of the park on there for you, but I love some of those scenes because the the background really it doesn't explain why Tarek left, and they're kind of like a, oh, not a bounty, but sort of like a bounty situation, and it's just, there's some fun decision points for them, but Tarek lost the love of his life, and that's why he left the Thieves Guild. And so this is a very rich, contemplative character there. Uh, he's just trying to find contentment. That's just his thing. And, and it's one of those things where like loss sucks. And this character helps you lean into that. So if, I mean, if you have any experience to draw on, I'm sure you could role play Tarek just fine in that regard. But uh, one of the things he's done in his journey is he has made some friends with the Myconids, and he's actually the quest giver for the group when it comes to the Seagro Caves, which we'll go into more in future videos and how that works together. But Tarek was one of my favorite NPCs and I loved playing him and I loved the way the party got to interact with him. So Tarek's a big one. I love to hear how you would role play Tarek if you would be so kind in the comments section. The last major NPC to go over is Varnoth, who is the former feared general of the Azure wolves and just one look i mean they describe her this, this woman has seen some battle she's got prosthetics she's got milky eye like she's just she's battle <laughs> grizzled and hardened and uh any character that has the soldier background i believe it's the dwarven cleric that they uh got to they, they know who she is immediately in our playthrough we actually had uh josh he was playing a barbarian who used to be under her command. And I, that was a little tweak that I made. And uh, he was playing, and this is a little spoiler for our playthrough, but he was playing a barbarian who was afraid of his own rage. So Josh kind of purposely gave himself really a disadvantage by not using rage uh, throughout most of the playthrough uh, because one of the things that we leaned into was some of her injuries were caused by him because he lost control. So that was a really fun thing that we could lean into and explore. So like I said, we had some pretty deep moments in our in our game and something I, I really appreciate. I think Josh, my goodness, Zugarf was really cool character, very cool character. One of his favorite themes is the warrior poet. And it was really great to do that. But uh, she's got a gruff demeanor. She's someone that's just like hard on the outside and inside is just a soft teddy bear, right? She's very empathetic. She actually believes in second chances above uh, all else, you know, and, and like it's just the outside and the inside don't always seem to match. But a lot of times that happens in life because life sucks. And I loved Varnath uh, in terms of like what she does for the cloister. She is like does masonry work and things like that. So there was a couple of scenes or at least one scene where I had her you know, just doing some repairs around the temple and things like that. So that's the kind of character that Varnoth is. Uh, she's also the one who saw the ship, one of the one of the people that saw the ship crash for the cursed shipwreck. So she's going to be sort of like a quest giver there, although I think that kind of works 
a little more with her and Runara. I actually had them together for that scene uh, when that was going on, which again, we'll get into more details there, both in the next video for Dragon's Rest and the Cursed Shipwreck video. But yeah, Varnoth was a very cool character and it was really fun to kind of do some tweaks in, in how to tie her and one of my player characters together because I really liked how that turned out. It was a lot of fun. All right, now we're talking about the Kobolds. We can't talk about the NPCs of Dragons of Storm Wreck Isle without bringing up the Kobolds. And really, I mean, I think if I'm just looking at it from a design standpoint, they're really just here for comedic relief. There's like, like two sentences on each one of them and they're just kind of silly. And that's fine. You can lean into that. You can pick or use one to uh, you can use as many as you want or not use as many as you want. However, one suggestion I have is to focus on Myla and uh, she has two brothers, Mech and Min, who actually are part of Spark Render's crew. Now, this never came up in our playthrough, and I think I could have done that a little bit better, but there's some timing things that I want to change and I think would work better for you because in the cursed shipwreck, the story is, I think it's like four days ago, they saw a ship crash and yet nobody went to go investigate it. Which I think makes no sense. You're supposed to paint these people as good people and nobody went to go see if there was anything they could do. So, I think the way that works better is to change the timing there. And I think having Mech and Min be the two people that go to investigate the ship and then they never return creates an air of mystery, creates an air of urgency, and it creates an air of personal attachment for Myla with the group to kind of give a certain sense of like, okay, this is important for them to do and for them to get it right. And then when they encounter Mech and Min later at the Clifftop Observatory, there's just more interesting decision points to be had. So those are the tweaks that I would I would definitely recommend. And I'm going to go into more details into my thoughts about that a little bit later in, say, the Dragon's Rest video and maybe perhaps the Cursed Shipwreck video. But those are my suggestions for you there, because I think I think they could have done better with the Kobolds and they could have been comedic relief, but then also I just think there could have been a little bit more there and that's that's one of the the timing of this one and the timeline it's really one of my biggest critiques of this adventure and i think this is a big fix and a very simple one i believe those are the major npcs and uh really the key adventure background information that you just need to have a grasp on when you're kind of wrapping your head around how all of this will come together for your adventure with your players but I, of course, I would love to hear thoughts that you have on the adventure as a whole, the NPCs that we mentioned or anything I didn't mention that you think is important. Please let us know in the comment section. And as always, thank you so much for watching and check out our link tree in the description because we've got a link to our discord in there and we would love to see you hanging out there with us too. So thank you so much for watching. Hope you had a good time and I'm going to have some more tips for each individual chapter moving forward. Hopefully it's on screen right now. Maybe you can click on that one. All right, take care, everybody.